In this lecture short, I'm going to be talking about the protein myoglobin and perform a structure function analysis of, of it. <laughs> okay, so when we first kind of take a step back and look at the structure of myoglobin, there's a couple things that jump out at us. So here I've got the pyamol movie that I've made circling. One thing we see is that it's monomeric. So it's just a single monomer of itself. It, so the quaternary structure is monomeric. We notice that its secondary structure is, is fairly alpha helical. I don't see any beta sheets anywhere. I just see lots of alpha helices and I see some random loops and coils here. What actually also is pretty interesting is if you look at this helix right here, you notice that it's got a big kink in it. Do you see that? So it's straight, but then it's got a kink and then it comes this way. I bet a hundred dollars that right at that kink, there's a proline. Anytime you see things like that in, a, in the structure, that's usually indicative that there's a proline. Why a proline? Because proline is geometrically constrained. Right, it's the only amino acid side chain that folds back on itself. So somewhere where that kink is on that alpha helix, there's a proline. Other than that, usually you always see the alpha helices are straight, kind of like this one right here. So you'd see it straight and then maybe there'd be a loop or a turn that would connect it to another one. But if you see something like that, that's usually indicative of a proline. Sorry, I'm getting crazy. So that talks a little bit about its primary structure is right there, <laughs> there's, a pro, there's a proline there. Okay, the other thing, about this myoglobin is that it has a prosthetic group bound. So that's highlighted here in yellow. So the green is all the protein. This red double dot, that's an oxygen molecule, O2. And then we've got this yellow sticks, which is this heme prosthetic group. So both myoglobin and hemoglobin are gonna have these heme uh, prosthetic groups in them. We'll see in chapter seven that there's, when uh, non-protein things are bound, they're either called one of two things. They're called cofactors or prosthetic groups. Prosthetic groups are a, co a type of cofactor. Sorry, I misspoke. There are two types of cofactors. There's co-substrates and prosthetic groups. Prosthetic groups are a type of cofactor that is tightly bound in the protein and never leaves. Okay, so it's acting kind of like a prosthetic group of someone, maybe an amputee that lost its, their arm, how they'd have a prosthetic arm in place. So it's tightly bound, it doesn't leave. The other type of cofactor would be a co-substrate. And that would be a molecule that's non-protein that comes in and helps catalyze the reaction in some capacity. ATP is a really great example of a of a cofactor that's considered a co-substrate. Usually ATP is not tightly bound. They come in, they also do something with the chemistry and then they leave again. Usually they leave something different like ADP or AMP. Okay, so looking again, initial structural analysis of, hemo of myoglobin. I can tell you it's quaternary structure is monomeric. It don't really have too much to tell you about the tertiary structure right off the bat. I can tell you that the, it has this prosthetic group that's bound and I've got a histidine here, a histidine here and an oxygen molecule there. So those histidines are helping coordinate and hold the oxygen and this prosthetic group in place. That's a little, probably off the bat, the only thing I can tell you about the tertiary structure. And that's because I showed what the side chains look like for those histidines that I'm, we're gonna talk about in a second. Secondary structure, it's alpha helical. And then as far as the primary structure goes, usually you're, there's not much you can tell, except for I remember I saw that little kink in that alpha helix and I was like, oh, there's gotta be a proline there. <laughs> okay. One thing I want you to recognize or notice about the structure of this heme prosthetic group is that it's got a really hydrophobic region. So this back part back here doesn't really have any polar groups. And then it's got a very polar side that has two carboxylic acid moieties. And I'm sure those two are deprotonated at physiological pH because the pKa of any of the average carboxylic acid is about four, maybe five. So at physiological pH of seven, it's gonna be deprotonated. Notice in the structure, 
that the, the carboxylic acids are pointing out towards the surface of the protein that interacts with water. And the superhydrophobic part is kind of tucked in to that center of the protein. And remember the center of the protein tends to be where the, where the hydrophobic residues hang out because they don't want to be anywhere near that water that's all around outside this protein. Okay, so if we look at how the oxygen's bound, remember myoglobin is a protein that stores oxygen for when we need it in kind of extreme emergencies. Uh, it's found in your muscles. It's also found in animals that tend to dive underwater for really extended periods of time. And you can alter the expression of myoglobin um, kind of if you're a deep sea diver, if you, you know, you practice long enough, your body will make more myoglobin than the average person so that you can store oxygen and hold your breath for a little bit longer. Okay. That's how some deep sea divers can hold their breath for five, six minutes. That's crazy. I barely can do it for 30 seconds. All right. So how is that oxygen being held and coordinated inside that protein? So if we look here, we've got two uh, three players of the game. We've got what we call the distal histidine. We've got a proximal histidine. And then we've got that heme prosthetic group. Okay. Um, just to, to declutter this image, they only show that center where the iron is because the iron is what is coordinating with the oxygen itself. Okay. And what's holding the iron in the center of that heme group are the four nitrogens in the rings of the porphyrin ring. Okay, so we've got the distal histidine. How does this interact with the oxygen? Well, it can hydrogen bond. So that histidine's got that, uh, it should be positively charged for the most part. And it both ion pairs with the oxygen. You're going, wait, Dr. Hughes, that oxygen doesn't have a charge on it. Not now, but give me a next slide and I'll show you what this crazy chemistry that occurs with the iron center and the oxygen, okay? So two ways, it can hydrogen bond and can an ion pair. And the other, so the other interaction here would be the oxygen itself coordinating with the iron. And we'll see that what's gonna hold those two in place is gonna be an ion pair as well. And then you've got the proximal histidine down here, which is in proximity to the iron group of the heme ring. And that is coordinating and holding that heme, the, sorry, the iron in place in that center. So the iron's getting actually coordinated by six things. Four of them are nitrogens in the plane of that heme ring. One is a nitrogen. So the lone pair of nitrogens below in the proximal hist. And the other, the sixth thing that's helping hold, kind of coordinate that iron is the oxygen molecule that's bound. So this crazy chemistry that occurs with the iron center. So when oxygen binds to the iron center, so the iron uh, exists as iron two. The iron can be, usually you see two types of ions of iron, iron two and iron three. Okay, so when oxygen binds, what happens is that an electron from the iron transfers to the oxygen and you create a superoxide, this O2 minus. The iron two, then after losing an electron becomes iron three plus, so iron three, okay? So you can see that what's holding the oxygen in place here is gonna be maybe the, is the electrostatic. So this iron is plus three charge. We've got it now we've got a superoxide uh, O2 minus charge. And remember what's coordinating up here is a histidine, which is remember where I said the ion pair because histidine is gonna be positively charged. It can be hydrogen bonding and ion pairing to hold this oxygen in place. Because remember, the whole function of this protein is to store oxygen. So I keep, we're just really focusing on how this oxygen is being held in this protein. Okay, so this is that, uh, how the ion pairing works. It's the crazy chemistry that occurs with the iron. So when oxygen binds, iron donates an electron, iron becomes, oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining, oil rig. The iron becomes oxidized because it lost an electron and the oxygen molecule becomes reduced because it gained the electron there. How do we know that? Well, we know that because free heme, if you just had free heme by itself, if I went and grabbed heme off the shelf in the chemistry lab and dissolved it in water and then you know, bubbled in a whole bunch of oxygen, 
it doesn't bind free oxygen. In fact, what happens is, is the iron center oxidizes from iron two to iron three. So that's how we know that this electron is being donated to the oxygen. So you're making that super oxide, the O2 minus. Um, and then what else is kind of crazy is that that just doesn't happen. Like you have to have this protein to be able to bind the oxygen molecule to the heme or coordinate the oxygen molecule to the heme. So that heme, remember we talked about the back half was pretty hydrophobic and pointed inside the core of the protein, which tends to be where the hydrophobic residues hang out. So the heme, even without an oxygen being bound, since it's in that hydrophobic pocket, it, it keeps it in that reduced state of a iron plus two. Okay, so then once the oxygen can snake its way kind of in this hole, bloop and bind to the iron center and be held in there, then you see that oxidation of uh, iron two to iron three and the superoxide formation. So if we were to look at a binding curve of myoglobin, so the next one we're gonna look at is hemoglobin. So don't for right now, we don't care so much about this blue curve, we're focusing on the red curve. So this is the myoglobin binding curve. Okay. Our y-axis is represented by fraction bound. So one is 100% of the proteins have oxygen bound. 50 is 50% of the proteins have an oxygen bound, right? And then zero would be no oxygen bound. Our x-axis is the partial pressure of oxygen. Okay. So in TOR, and this is not a percentage, TOR. Remember, one atmosphere, 760 TOR, that calculation might pop up every now and then. But at 100 TOR is the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere that we breathe, okay? Because it's also the partial pressure of oxygen in our lungs, okay? Because we're always breathing in the air around us. So partial pressure is 100. And then as that oxygen moves on to the hemoglobins and then that gets pumped through and then dissolves out into the areas where there's lower oxygen concentration and binds to some myoglobins in our muscles, right? The tissue, oops, sorry, the tissue partial pressure ranges anywhere from 20 to 40, depending upon how active you are. Like if you're super exercising, the partial pressure of oxygen is gonna be really low because you're, you're using all that oxygen to create energy. Maybe if you're sleeping, you're not so much. So in the tissues, maybe the partial pressure is a little bit on the higher end, like around 40, uh, 40 tor. Okay, but as you can see that any myoglobin in the cells around your lungs, 100% of those proteins are gonna have the uh, oxygen bound. Okay, well, practically 100%, right? Maybe 99.8. Um, once you reach the tissue, so anywhere in this range of the tissues, it looks like it's anywhere from 90% to 97% have an oxygen bound. It's only, so maybe for, sorry, let me say this. So maybe for humans, since this is kind of the human range in our tissues, you know, we don't really use our myoglobin that much. And in fact, next slide, you could knock out myoglobin in mice and they're totally fine. So it's not necessary for us, okay? What happens is what, what, what animals might use it, like whales, is because when they dive deep down, they're down there for 15, 20, 30 minutes. They're swimming, they're needing to use oxygen to generate energy to keep moving. And so their partial pressure is going to dip below this 20 tor mark. So let's say if the whale swimming underwater after 15 minutes, the partial pressure of oxygen is roughly, let's say eight tor. So here's 10, so maybe eight, a little below. The fraction of myoglobin that are bound is closer to, what is that, uh, 70, 72%. So that means that from the lungs of the whale down here, it's offloaded about 30% of oxygen. So it's supplying some oxygen to the cells so they can be using that cellular respiration and moving their muscles and swimming around and stuff. It must get even lower because, right, whales can be under there for a long time. So they're using up the myoglobin oxygen and they keep using it and the partial pressure just keeps dropping. And so notice that the myoglobin can offload even more oxygen for the whales. At some point, the whales will have to come up because there's no oxygen left and they will die unless they get it. So they have to resurface. And then once they uh, resurface, they can fill their lungs up. That oxygen goes around and spreads around and essentially recharges all the myoglobin to have 
oxygen ready so that when it's back down deep sea diving, it can provide oxygen by offloading uh, those molecules as the partial pressure of oxygen decreases in the cells. Okay, um, the shape of this curve, a lot of times I talk about the shape, the shape of this curve is hyperbolic. Okay, so the red curve is a hyperbolic curve. Um, and we'll see when I talk about hemoglobin, this is the shape of this curve is called sigmoidal. See how it kind of looks like an S, S for sigmoidal. And this big jump over is a hyperbolic curve. Okay, so to recap, what specifically about the structure of myoglobin aids in its function? There's a lot of things you can talk about here. Okay, so this is the structure function analysis or the study. So what do we know? So we know that things that we've covered, the that the prosthetic group's necessary to help coordinate this oxygen, right? So define the function, I guess, first. The function of myoglobin is to store oxygen in case we're in dire straits and we need it, <laughs> as you can see from that curve, the hyperbolic curve of it. Okay, so how, what about this protein helps it store oxygen? Well, it's got a heme group that's bound, that prosthetic group's bound, okay? There's a cavity, right, or in that one image, there's a cavity that allows for this heme to bind, right? The hydrophobic core of the protein allows the hydrophobic portion of the prosthetic group to kind of slither in there and, and hang on, okay? Um, the iron center also helps the oxygen bind, because the iron center donates an electron to the uh, oxygen molecule so that it can be held in place by this proximal, sorry, distal histidine. So the distal histidine is at the top, proximal is at the bottom because it's in proximity to the iron center. So um, that, so the electrons uh, from the iron center uh, donate to the oxygen molecule and allow it to be held and coordinated in place through ionic interactions or through ion pairing. Okay. What else about this structure um, did we cover? So you talk about the electrons jumping, the proximal and distal hist for sure, the fact that it has that prosthetic heme group bound. I guess you could mention that study where free heme in solution does not bind oxygen. So that protein uh, makes it so that the heme can bind oxygen and help coordinate it. So I'd be pretty happy if you could get two or three of those points uh, to talk about that structure function analysis of myoglobin. Okay, and with that, we'll move on to hemoglobin.